from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Yours will be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I see, the only name that matters to me. Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling at me, the only name that matters to me. Cause yours is the name, the name that saved me The mercy and grace, the power that forgave me And your love is all I've ever needed And yours is the name, the name that saved me The mercy and grace, the power that forgave me And your love is all I've ever needed when I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Ask God, yours will be Yours will be the only name that matters to me, the only one whose favor I see, the only name that matters to me. Yours will be the friendship and affection I need to feel my father smiling at me, the only name that matters to me. Cause yours is the name, cause yours is the name, the name that saved me. The mercy and grace, the power that forgave me. And your love is all I've ever needed. Sing that again. Oh, yours is the name, the name that saved me. The mercy and grace, the power that forgave me. And your love, it's all I've ever needed. When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints, I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim When I wake up, when I wake up in the land of glory With the saints, I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Come on, let's just declare that name, Jesus Oh, Jesus, 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 just that name. Sing that again, Jesus. Jesus, 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 just that name. Sing Jesus again, come on. Jesus, 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 just that name. One more time, Jesus, we worship you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, 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 just that name. When I wake up, when I wake up in the land of glory with the saints, I will tell my story. There will be one name that I proclaim. Yes, Lord, we're going to proclaim your name. 
When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Sing that one more time, come on, when I wake up When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Come on, sing la 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 Oh la 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 Oh la 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 Jesus We proclaim your name The name above all names Jesus King of the world. 
All right, let's get our Bibles open this morning. We want to look here at 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, and we want to pick up where we left off last time. First, or 2 Corinthians, the 8th chapter, the first verse. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on us in the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abound unto the riches of their liberality. For to, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, that they were willing of themselves." praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of ministering to the saints. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for your word today. God, I just rejoice that, Lord, you reveal your secrets. You reveal your truths. You reveal to us the reality of how your kingdom works. And I thank you, God, that as we look into your perfect law of liberty, we will grasp the truth, we will understand the principle, we will apply the principle, and we will participate in it on a regular, consistent basis that you may do that which you've asked us to do. So I thank you for that in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, We've been studying this for the last couple of weeks, and I, I want to continue on with it because we're about ready to blow open some lies of the devil that have stopped the flow of God's blessing in our lives. As we look at this passage of Scripture here, we understand that in the second verse, it says that in a great trial of affliction, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy right in the midst of their poverty released a spirit in them. Now, we don't understand that, or we probably didn't realize what was happening there, but what was taking place is the moment that they purposed in their heart to be able to help the brethren in Macedonia, an amazing thing happened. They released the spirit. The moment you say, I will be obedient, you release the power of the Spirit of God to go and take over and cause an outpouring of something that God desires to do for you. Please say amen to that. And so what happens here is what we want to get a hold of, that right there in the middle of their poverty, their joy overpowered their poverty. Somebody say amen to that, because that's good. Their joy overpowered their poverty. And you won't give to something without joy in what you're giving to. I'm going to tell you something. There's folks right here who would get great joy to give the NFL $4,000 to go to the Super Bowl today. That would be great joy for some of us. That's just because your team ain't playing. <laughs> See, your joy is the thing that releases the strength and the Spirit of God to work on your behalf. And so to support his work here on earth, God has said, I want you to participate by doing something, by allowing the strength of your joy to allow the Spirit of God himself to move on your behalf by engaging into a principle that I have defined for you. And that principle is give and it will be given good measure, pressed down. Good measure, pressed down. I used to quote that scripture and Lois back there used to hound me all the time. You forgot good measure. I didn't anymore, Lois. Okay, you see what's happening? See, here's what's happening. When we give with good measure, comes against, it comes for us and begins to work on our behalf. So God, in his infinite wisdom, says, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to release your joy towards me by the giving of your tithe. Uh-oh. Did you just say tithe? Yeah. 
I'm going to say about 40 more times this morning too. Because it's the key principle that engages you with God and creates the release of his spirit and his nature through you. Please say amen. And you know what? Tithing will make us feel uneasy if we don't understand and allow the joy of it to permeate us and release our hold on things. Because it's in giving that you give up your self-nature, your self-control, and you turn it over and say, God, I trust you. Now look at this scripture again with me in the second verse. Because it says in the second verse, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of joy, and you ought to just underline that in your Bible, the abundance of joy, the abundance of joy. Joy of what? They were in a great trial of affliction. Joy of what? They didn't have anything. The next part of that verse says they were in deep poverty. They were in deep poverty. They were being overwhelmed by attacks and afflictions and everything else, but yet somehow out of the abundance of their joy, out of the abundance of their joy, out of the abundance of their joy, out of the abundance of their joy. Man, when you get the joy of the Lord working on your behalf, it doesn't matter whether God tells you to go give somebody a shake of the hand or a $100 bill in their palm of the hand. It doesn't matter anymore because the abundance of joy that begins to fill you and flow out of you is overwhelming all the obstacles to God blessing you. Somebody please say amen. And here's what it really says. Out of their need, they sowed. Out of their deed, they sowed. Out of their need, they purpose to give. And in that purposing to give, the joy of that decision produced the substance to be able to give. Now get this, because this is really significant for us today. Notice there in the second verse it says this, how they were in a great trial of affliction and they were in deep poverty but the abundance of their joy abounded unto the riches of their liberality. And that word liberality means giving. So here's what happened. Right in the midst of great trial and affliction, right in the midst of great poverty where they didn't have anything, barely surviving, just getting by, hoping above hope for their next meal perhaps, out of all of that, they begin to allow the joy of the Lord that was in them, the joy that could rise up and strengthen them, the joy that could support them and undergird them, the joy itself somehow produced in their midst something to be able to give to somebody else. Something was manifested for them that they didn't have. They were in affliction. They had great Great, great, great poverty. They were abundant in poverty. But the abundance of their joy, says, produced riches. But they didn't have any riches. They were under attack. But just by allowing the joy of God that's in us produces what Luke 6, 38 says. Give, and it'll be given back good measure, shaken together, running over, God will give into your bosom. And then it says this, for whatever you met, M-E-T-E, and that means for whatever you give, it'll be measured back to you in the same way. Whatever we give, whatever we met, it will be measured back to us in exactly the same way. It'll be measured back to us in the way that we give. Now, here's something of great significance for us. They abounded unto riches. Luke 6, 38 says, in the measure that you give, it will be given back to you. In the measure you give, it'll be given back to you. 
when Jesus was in the temple and he was watching all the Pharisees and Sadducees coming in and paying their tithe in the temple, a little old widow woman walked in. This little widow woman probably could be classified in the abundance of trials and tribulations and in deep poverty because the only thing she had was a mite. And she brought the widow's mite. And we're reading about it now, thousands of years later. She brought the widow's mite into the temple and put it in the collection offering. And Jesus looked at her and said, she's given more than all the rest of them. Well, we know the rest of them gave a lot more in physical substance than she did, but he said she's given more. Right away, we're going to say to ourselves, well, she only had one mite, which is less than a penny, I believe. She only had that one mite. She couldn't give much more, but it wasn't in what she gave. It wasn't the amount in what she gave. What it was is her heart attitude and that abundance of joy of God in her that she could bring her last might. You go to Elijah when he went to the widow woman, and he told the widow woman, make me a cake. And she said, I, I only got enough for me and my son. I'm making one more cake, and we're going to eat it, and then we're going to die. But he said, make it for me first. Make it for me first. Make it for me first. Would you turn to somebody and tell them, Make it for him first. Make it for him first. Make it for him first. So that would mean in the natural realm, she was going to die sooner because maybe the cake would have lasted her life one more day. He said, make it for me first. And the result of that is because of the position she put herself in. She said, I only got enough oil and flour to make one cake. We were going to eat it and die. But the man of God says, make me the cake first. Make me the cake first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Wow. Give me the cake first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know what happened to the lady? The oil never ran dry. The barrel of meal never ran out. And she was provided for after she gave first to the man of God. Here these people are in deep poverty. And their joy abounds to the point where they're going to be obedient. And they're going to give to this work so that their brothers can receive. And what they probably didn't realize when they did it, they were being measured as to the level of which they were willing to give. And so they're willing to give all the way down into the depth of their poverty that someone else may receive in their time of need. And if we believe the Word of God and we apply Luke 6, 38, I'm going to tell you the results of the joy that gave them the strength to give produced for them good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will other men give unto their bosom? Somebody say amen, because this, in the midst of their joy, in the midst of their joy, they had nothing and were being bombarded in attack and affliction and somewheres in that joy that was in them produced the riches to be able to help someone else. You know what that passage of Scripture does? It blows away our excuses that we can't give our tithe because we'll never make it if we do. It blows away that... And you know, I'm just making it now, Pastor. If I had to give up another 10%, I, I, I don't know if I could make it. They gave out of deep poverty and added affliction on top of that. And they still were able to give. And when they did it from the abundance of joy that was in there, it produced riches. So their joy produced riches. Their joy in what? Their joy in being able to line up with the nature of God. And any time we line up with the nature of God, God's nature fills us and flows through us. 
And when God's nature flows through us, his word is going through us. And he said, my word never returns. Say it out loud, please. Never returns void. So the moment I allow the joy of my strength in him, which is really my trust in him, my ability to believe in him, to, to lay my life on the line for him, those things, the strength of my joy will activate my faith just like it did them, and we too will somehow find the resources to be able to be obedient to God. And every time we're obedient, because he said obedience is better than sacrifice. Every time we're obedient to God, God will open the windows up of heaven and begin to pour us out a blessing. There'll be so much of it we can't even receive it all. Somebody say amen, please. Because I'm giving you a key today. I'm trying to help you today to break forth into the abundance of what God has for you. I'm trying to help you today understand the principle. And let me explain something to you. I hate talking about money. I don't like talking about giving and, and tithing. It, it's our nature. We just do it. But I know what God told me. He asked me one day, he said, would you teach the people about my healing? I said, yes. He said, why would you do that? He said, because it'll get them healed and, and it'll help them. He said, would you teach my my children about walking on serpents and scorpions and nothing will injure them because I've transferred the power to them? Yes. Yes, I would do that. I would, I would, I would, I would do that for you. Why would you do that? Because it would help the people. He said, then why wouldn't you talk about giving? Because the giving will help the people. Somebody say amen, please. Amen. The, the, the giving principles of God will help you break forth out of your abounding poverty. See, it's our joy in giving that produced and supplied everything they needed. So it was the strength of our joy that found a willingness to give. And anytime, listen to me carefully, anytime you find a willingness to give, God will always give you something to give. Hello? I know Helen and I have purposed in our hearts already that when we get to the next phase, the secure it phase, what we're, excuse me, what we're going to do. And then when we get to the dress it phase of the new building, we, we know what we're going to do. We've already purposed that in our hearts. We've already purposed several other things for this year in 2017. We've already begun to give towards God's kingdom because we know that the joy and the strength of our giving will produce the riches for us to be able to supply what we've committed ourselves to do because God will always release what we purpose to do because what he can bring through you, he'll bring to you. If he can get money into the kingdom of God through you, he'll give you the money to give to the kingdom of God and leave enough left over for you to be able to be blessed and be able to be multiplied. Somebody say amen, please. And so what we've got to understand is that God is asking for 10% of our substance, and he's asking us for two purposes that his work may continue on, his kingdom may prosper, but secondly, that he can bless us. But, Pastor, I'm just getting by without tithing. I'm just getting by without giving anything. If I start giving or if I start paying tithes, I'm going to go under. No, you're not because it's the abundance of the joy that you're now given to the kingdom of God that will find the riches to take care of the 10% that you're given to God. You see, it never fails. God's principles work. Somebody please say amen. God's principles work. God's principles work. God's principles work. So how will we make it if we're just giving and just making it now without giving the 10%, how are we ever going to make it? I want to give you two scripture verses. Just write the references down. You don't need to turn there or anything. In, first tith, in Titus, I'm sorry, in the first chapter of Titus, in the second verse, it says this. 
It says, God cannot lie. Would you please turn to someone right now and tell them, God cannot lie. Turn to somebody else and tell them that. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. He cannot lie. Man, I love people that cannot lie. I know when somebody that cannot lie tells me, Pastor, I'm going to come all over your house and I'm going to power wash your whole house. I know that if they do not lie, I can count on it that someday they'll be over to my house. Now, it may be after I'm dead, buried, and gone that they come, but they'll be there. Why? Because they don't lie. God not only doesn't lie, he can't lie. God can't lie. So when God said this, give and shall be given back good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God cannot lie. See, what we, both, what we really have trouble getting hold of is that statement, that phrase right there from Titus. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Are you tired of hearing me say that yet? Good, because I'm saying it again. God cannot lie. God cannot lie. In fact, he is so profound on the truth and telling you the truth that he gives you a challenge in Malachi, the third chapter. Turn over there with me for a moment. He reveals to himself to us in a phenomenal way by saying to us in the first chapter, second verse of Titus, that God cannot lie. In Malachi, the third chapter, he says this in the 10th verse, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, and, and I want you to stop right there, and the next two words are the most important words you ever heard. Prove me. You ought to underline that. Prove me. In other words, test me. See if what I'm telling you is not the truth. If I'm telling you the truth, it will work for you. So he says this, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me. So I'm in a place where I really don't know if I could afford to give my tithes because I'm just making it now. Prove me. I'm in a place of great attack. Man, I, a lot of affliction on me. Prove me. Oh, the doctor gave me a bad report, and I don't think I'm going to make it. Prove me. Prove me, prove me, prove me. Why? Because I cannot lie. It is impossible for me to lie. I tell you exactly the way it works, the way I work, what you have to do to get it to work, and I will do it every time if you will just do what I tell you to do. Please say amen. Come on, you can say it louder. I know I'm talking about money, but you can say it. Prove me. Prove me. Prove me. How am I going to prove him? I'm going to try what he asked me to do. I'm going to do exactly what he said. If he said, test me, if he said, bring ye the tithes, and we're reading that, bring ye the tithes into the storehouse that there be meat in my house. That's the first thing he's going to do. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. We don't eat in the house. Yes, you do. You eat the word of God in the house. Meat in the house is spiritual food for you. So when you come into church, you don't get leftovers. How many tired of leftovers? I don't like leftovers. I'll be honest with you. We try to just have enough food just to get through a meal, but we always wind up thinking that family members are going to eat more than they actually do, so we always have leftovers, and we try to pawn them off on them because we don't like leftovers. You neither? Eat it all at the one time. Uh, if you eat my leftovers, raise your hand and we'll send them over to you. Brian, you got them. Okay, Diana, you got them. 
What? Yeah, have a, well, you got to wait till we're done. It's called leftovers, not sit down and eat with us. <laughs> There'll be meat in my house. There'll be meat in my house. There'll be meat in my house. Now, he says something to start this out in verse number eight there in, the, in Malachi 3. He says, will a man rob God? Would you be a robber? In other words, are you taking from God what God has asked you to give to him? And the verse goes on to say, well, how were we a robber? And he says, in tithes and offerings. When you don't give your tithes and you don't give your offerings, you're robbing from God. Now, I want you to get something. Because this is of great significance. Will a man rob God? How are we robbing you, God? In tithes and offerings. This is the verse 8. Just check it to make sure I'm not lying to you. Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and in offerings. All right. When we do not understand what that means, that we're robbing God, it is very easy for us not to understand the flow of this principle. Will a man rob God? That's me. Will a man rob God? A man. That's me. Will a man rob God? Hey, that's still me. Will a man rob God? It's me. Will a man, that's me, rob God? Will a man rob God? I think pastor's just lost it. He thinks, you're, he thinks he's a God. Well, the Bible says, are you not all gods? Here's the principle. Here's the key of this whole thing. Will a man rob God? Where on this earth does God live? Bingo. He lives inside of you. He inhabits you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So if you're robbing God, who now dwells and lives and takes residence inside of you, who are you really robbing? You're robbing yourself. You're robbing the temple that God dwells in who is just waiting to do all these other things that he's promised here in the 11th verse. After he says, prove me and see if I will not pour out, or the 10th and the 11th, see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall destroy the fruit and, shall, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time. What's he talking about? He doesn't need any of that. He's talking about us, the God that lives in us. So who am I robbing? I'm I'm robbing me. I'm robbing me of all of those things that God said, if you would allow your joy to rise up and allow that which I am in you to work like I've told you it would work, because I cannot lie, then all these things will start flowing in your direction. All these things will become yours. You will not be classified as a robber. You will not, you will not, you will not be succumbed by the things of this world. And here's the most amazing thing, whether you like this or not. Once you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're under the laws of heaven whether you like it or not. You are no longer under the laws of buying and selling. You are under the law of giving and receiving. 
And everything in your life as a born-again believer from this moment on or from that moment that you accepted Christ is not dictated by how much you can sell and how much you can buy. And you sell, your, you sell yourself, you sell your time, your talents, your abilities to some employer who then returns money for that. You're not under that anymore, even though you still may have to have a job here to survive, but you're under the law of sowing and reaping. And so the only way you're really going to get ahead in this world and in this life is understanding that the spiritual laws of God are the things that are working for you. And when you violate them, you suffer the consequences of those because those laws supersede the laws of this earth. Somebody say amen. And so instead of you having to go out and go crazy and labor and do all kinds of crazy things, I'm telling you something, the law of sowing and reaping works. I'll tell you how much I believe in that. I believe in giving 10% to God. We give, we give much more than that. But I'll tell you how much I believe in this. When we came to this church 30 years ago, this church was in really the midst of affliction. Wasn't it, George? George can tell you, the bills were astronomical. You added up all the debt that we owed and all the things that still needed to be bought and parking lots, and that thing came up to almost three quarters of a million dollars. Now, it was due over 20 years, but it was still there. We got that all paid off. We are totally debt-free. Everything that you see on this property is owned by the church. That new building that we're working on, there's a million something in it, isn't it? Million, million one, million two, million. A million into that building right now, and we have put it all in out of our sacrificial giving. And you know what? We did it because the first week in here, God said, I want you to take 10% off your top of all your giving of tithes and offerings, and I want you to give it to missions. And you know, today, besides our missions offerings, all of our tithes and offerings get 10% taken off the top and given to missions because that's God's nature. And today, we're totally debt-free. Today, we're respected as a church. We're not the laughing stock as a church. We're respected. And people come to us in high places and ask for our counsel and our wisdom and why is that? Because we gave. We took on the nature of God. Today, our television broadcast is in three million homes. Hi, Brandy. Three million homes. Our television bill is ex pretty decent. Do you know we've never had to ask for contributions on television? Not once in 20, 20 years. 22 years, 22 years we've been on the television airways and never once asked anyone to send us money. And God has provided that for us. Do we believe in this stuff? You better believe it. You're sitting on pews that are paid for. You're sitting in a controlled environment, whether it be heat in the winter or, or air conditioning in the summer, because we believe that God does what he said, because we found out God can not lie. Please say amen. See, tithes and offerings are required to be in the flow of God. So let me ask you this question before we close. Don't raise your hand. Just answer to yourself. How many of you here would like to have a nice two-week vacation in some sunny spot on a cruise ship or laying on the beach in a resort, eating nice food or maybe skiing in the mountains and sitting by the fireplace in the lodge? How many of you would like to have that? Yeah, that's fine. How many would like to have that? How many of you would just be happy to be able to go out to a really, really nice restaurant? I am not talking about Longhorn and Chili's. 
I'm talking about a classy restaurant, you know, where they wait on you and they serve you food that you don't even know what it is, but it looks so good, you're going to eat it anyway. How many of you all would like to go out to a real night and have it all paid for? How many of you aren't sure what you want? How many of you would like to drive a newer car than you have right now? How many of you would like to be able to go into a nice dress shop or or a clothing store and get a brand new suit or a brand new set of clothes and you're not buying the blue light special off the Walmart floor. You're going into a men's store or a ladies store and you're buying an outfit that is, you know, form fitting to you. It makes you look good, you know, kind of almost like what I look like all the time. You know, how many would like that? You want that? It's the flow of God. That's what produces the ability and the riches and the resources to be able to bless you. So if you're just getting by, if you're just struggling through another day, do what the Word of God says in Matthew, the 6th chapter, the 33rd verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. So where do you want to go for lunch today? Bow your heads with me. Taco Bell. Abraham, you got to raise your sights a little bit, buddy. let 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 me say this, though. To some people, Taco Bell is a expensive restaurant. By the way, how many of you do go to Taco Bell? I got to tell you, man, we don't go very often, but we went the other day, and they got this thing called a stacker, and it's a outside soft taco with a layer of cheese, then a hard taco, and then inside the hard taco is the meat and or the beans and the cheese and, and all that. It's really good, man. Chris has said, Chris just leaned over to Candace and said, we going to Taco Bell. <laughs> and Brian, when we're done eating at Taco Bell, I'll give you the napkins and the paper that's left over. Father, let's pray. Come on. Father, I thank you right now. Thank you in Jesus' name. God, sometimes we hit a brick wall when it comes to tithing. Sometimes, God, we justify and rationalize why it's almost impossible for us to give. But God, this one thing I know, you can't lie. It's impossible. And so if we take you at face value for just what you've said, bring ye the tithes into the storehouse and there'll be meat in my house. See if I won't pour out a blessing. Open the windows of heaven and pour it out. See if I won't rebuke the devourer and keep your your property and your possessions from breaking down and falling apart before the appointed time for them. God, you don't lie. You can't lie. You said if we'll give, it'll be pressed down a good measure, shaken together and running over. You said that as we measure out what we'll give, you'll measure out what you give to us. So, Father, let us grasp the truth of what we've studied today. God, let us see without a shadow of a doubt that the reason we might not be making it is because we are not giving it. Father, let us change our reasoning, our attitudes, and even our understanding. Let us not define that this is Old Testament doctrine because, God, we're reading in Corinthians, the New Testament, about how they gave to Macedonia. So I pray right now that if there's anyone here who have never understood the power of the flow of giving, the power and the flow of a tithe, the power and the flow of having the core nature of giving, above everything else, self-sufficiency, and even survival, that God today 
we will grasp the truth of it and we will apply it in our lives and we will see dramatic breakthroughs both for the church and our individual families. So I ask that in Jesus' name. Your heads are still bowed, your eyes are still closed. Maybe there's somebody here this morning and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Maybe you're here this morning and you don't know anything about this flow, but part of the flow of God is to bring all men unto himself to give you a new life. It's called being born again. To walk with you and talk with you, help you through your afflictions and your struggles. It's a God who cannot lie. So when he says, I'll be your rear guard, he means he'll be your rear guard. And so Father, today I need you. If that's your prayer, if you've never received Jesus Christ, you've never said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and I need him in my life. Or you did that a while ago, but somehow all life's afflictions got you on a road of detour. And today you realize you gotta give your life back to God. You gotta get back to him. You gotta start walking with him and talking with him and serving him so he can serve with you. If you fit either one of those categories, I'm praying the last prayer of this service. And if you are one of those two people that have never received and asked him to forgive you of your sins and write your name down in the reservation book of heaven, or you did that once but kind of backslidden, detoured, and you want to come back home, and you want to be included in this prayer right now, you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life for the first time or come back to him and be restored? Would you slip your hand up right now so I know to include you in this prayer? Anyone here quickly this morning? Jesus, thank you. Someone else quickly this morning. This is your day. This is your moment. This is when you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. This is when you want your life restored. You want this joy back in your life. You want the completeness. You want to rededicate your life today. You want to say, you know, I got detoured. I got sidetracked. But today, I'm making it right with God. A counselor will come to you. They have a Bible for you and some literature that you can take with you. Is there anyone else this morning? This is your moment. This is your time. You want to receive Christ for the first time or rededicate your life back to him one more time? Anyone else? Father, I rejoice. I rejoice that today salvation has come to this house again. I thank you, Lord, that a new life has surrendered to you, whether it's a rededication or a first-time decision. But today, God, they're going to begin to receive all the promises that you have given to those who believe because you cannot lie. So I thank you today, Father. I thank you and rejoice with your family of a new name written down in glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's make her feel welcome, shall we? Come on, stand up to your feet. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I wanted to let you know our church family would love to have you join us here in the sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Those services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study, Royal Rangers for the boys and G3 for the girls. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God and it happens at 7.15 every Wednesday evening. If you'd like more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of a great church. Well, until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours.
been here for 27 years, Helen and I. Uh, we came in 1986. 23 years. 32 years. It's either 10 or 11 years, I think. For 12 years. Uh, 22 years. 26 years. 26 and a half years. There were times when you hear the echoes in the building because of the lack of people. We had about 70 people and a whole lot of debt. Um, it was a little bit different than other churches that I've been to. Uh, got stretched a lot in the beginning. <laughs> the prayer path was still here. It's a wild pastor that would dance all over the pews and jump from pew to pew. We had no TV ministry back then. Oh man, I was scared, man. <laughs> I was scared, bro. I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. Wade Keller around the table at the ministry. We've grown from 70 families to about 500 uh, members now. I'm stretching. Much spiritual growth, a real impartation. Uh, change, growth, and more stretching. We've seen tremendous moves of the Holy Spirit. We've seen God do amazing things. So we saw a great growth spurt. Uh, we've teamed up our missions uh, programs with Apostle Roseman Romney in the Caribbean and Dr. Mike Panjo in Ohio. I felt like I was accepted where I was at each stage of my life. And some stretching. We're in a paradigm shift right now. And now God is bringing us to a new realm where he's asking us to be a door for people to come and find him. It's exciting, an exciting time. You see, you know, people growing to the place where they can step into their ministries. We've got this new element that we want to accept you where you are and value where you are and who you are and then love you enough to take you to a higher place. There's a, 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 a renewed fire, it's growing. And, and like I said, there's an expectancy here. It, and it's curiosity, but in a good way. Now you see the growth of the people that's coming in the house of worship, and that's a blessing in, in itself. There's a strong message of the Father's love and the grace of God coming forth. That's a question that we really uh, had to ask ourselves, because so many churches you know, claim special things. People gravitate here of different backgrounds and races. The freshness, it's not um, starchy, it's not religious always alive and, and exciting. very cutting edge. We worship hard, man. It's bringing people from everywhere. The church is the most segregated place. We were the only church in this entire community that was multiracial. And I just love what I see and sense and, and it's beautiful.